Um, but essentially, the reason why you create a website is so that you can have your own essential online real estate. So if you do have clients or you're trying to show your credibility, and I know that you're new to it, so what you want to make sure website is so that you can have your um, own the, and I know that you, ooh, feedback, <laughs> what you want to make sure that you do, let me go ahead and record on, um, you want to make sure that people can have access to you. And so Facebook is a great platform. Um, I think that Instagram, all, all the platforms that we use every day to get clients are excellent, but you have to keep in mind that like a lot of people who may need your help would never think of buying something on Facebook, right? Or think of buying something on Instagram. And so the hope is that you're reaching out to people. Um, hey, Christian, hey, Facebook. The hope is that as you're reaching out to people to secure clients, that you have organization, your back end is set up really well. And you are then able to essentially exist without having social media. Because what happens if social media is down for like two weeks for some strange reason? How do you market yourself? How do you get new clients, you know? Um, but if you have a website that's set up for people to access you, then you're okay. Um, so what I'm talking about with Christina is she's thinking about becoming a co-host and she was saying she doesn't know why she needs to have a website. Um, and so I, what I was explaining to her is like essentially the point of the website is to have a place where people can find you. But more than that, it shows your credibility. And I know a lot of times on social media, I bought from people whose website I've never seen, never seen a landing page. They send me a link to PayPal or something and I purchase from them. But I think that what you'll find, especially in real estate, if you want to be a co-host or a cleaner or you're trying to get loans and stuff like that, there's a lot of credibility that exists when you have things, at least a landing page, right? So maybe you don't have a website, but having a, or a one page website that's long form or something that people can always refer back to, I think it's helpful, um, at least something. Um, so good evening, everybody. It is 6.02. If you haven't been here the last couple of days, um, I typically start at like 6.03, 6.04, give people a chance to trickle in. Um, typically what happens is people come in a little late. <laughs> they get that last minute reminder email and they come in. So while we wait in good form, as I always do, if you could please go ahead and drop where you're from, if you are currently a host or not. And if you are not a host, where you are planning, or if you are, uh, where are you planning to start your Airbnb business? I'd like a city, not a state. Um, people love to tell me Texas. Cool. But more than Texas, right? Like, do you want to be in Houston, San Antonio? Um, go ahead and tell us more about you. Let's get to know one another. I think that, you know, I do these challenges to teach, but I also am a firm believer in community. And so I kind of feel like it's a waste if we don't talk to one another. Um, that's more important to me than anything. Like, I'd love to tell you more about landlord arbitrage. I could talk you into exhaustion about short-term rentals. Um, but one of the things that has kept me positive, informed, and learned is about the people who I've kept around me. And some of those people I've met in Facebook groups, some of those people I've met, you know, in other master classes, challenges, things like that. But the community aspect will continue to be um, the leverage that you want. Even here in Chicago, like when my cleaner um, got COVID, I needed a help. And so I went into the groups on Facebook looking for a cleaner. Um, no one had availability. It was a very busy weekend. I went into the co-host group. Someone had seen me post a response before they liked me. We had engaged a few times and they reached out and actually let, introduced me to their cleaner and they were able to help me for two weeks, right? And so as you're thinking about going into short-term rentals, I want you to A, not think about this Airbnb, but really focus in on how do I develop relationships? How do I develop community? Because, um, hey, Angel, what you will find in this business um, is that you need relationships. And I think that we talked a little bit about on Monday about how this is a stressful for me. A lot of that has to do with the fact that I do have really strong relationships with people in my ecosystem. So I have my plumber, but I know other Airbnb hosts. So I'm very quick to reach out to people and say, you know, hey, Tom, 
I need X, Y, Z. You have somebody who can help me. You know, and he'll reach out to me and say, hey, I need X, Y, Z. Do you know anybody who can help? And so we work together. And I think that that may be a unique experience in some capacity, but I, I know that the reason why I very rarely have any issues is because I don't think of competition as a bad thing. And so I'm constantly looking for ways to like add value, but also encouraging other people, right? To get into Airbnb. And, you know, it works out really well. So if you're just joining, can you please go ahead and especially on Facebook, because just so you guys know, if you come on Facebook, and I think I'm going to stop doing this on Facebook so much. I can't see you, right? I can't see your name. I have no idea you're here. So if you don't respond, if you don't comment, I can't engage you. If you have questions, I can't, you know, it's hard for me to add value in a way that might be meaningful for you. So please let us know again what city you're in. Um, if you are Airbnb host, let us shout you out. If not, go ahead and tell us, um, you know, where you plan to host Airbnb, preferably your city. Um, direct comments. So if you just do likes, if you just do hearts and things like that, I love it. It gets me excited. It's invigorating. But unfortunately, I still can't see who you are, which makes it um, a little bit harder to engage you. Ooh, okay. Um, so I am going to, like I do every day, because I know that everyone isn't here. Um, I am going to reintroduce myself really quickly. Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna reintroduce myself really quickly. Oh, thank you, Ebony, you left Facebook and came here. Thank you. You can all feel free to join me on Zoom. Um, I appreciate that as well. But again, I can't see you. So if you're on Zoom, I mean, if you're on Facebook, I'm happy to have you. Um, Somebody see somebody just asked me for the Zoom link. Let me drop the Zoom link on Facebook really quickly and we'll get going. I appreciate everyone's patience. How y'all doing today? I'm so sorry. How rude of me. I act like I don't have any manners. How y'all feeling today? Was today a good day? I know a lot of y'all are corporate hustlers and life is a little um, frustrating sometimes. I just had a conversation with somebody who said that, you know, they're ready to leave at nine to five. Okay. <laughs> they are sick and tired of being sick and tired. How are y'all doing? I am so sorry that I did not ask that question to start off. My apologies. I do have manners. Um, so <laughs> I actually am going to do something a little bit different today. So the last two days I've been doing what's called talking head, and we are going to switch that up a little bit. I do have a um, slideshow on Canva that I'm going to review. Christian said he's good. It's hot in Texas. It is hot in Texas. So it's so funny. In one of my Airbnbs, I, I like air conditioning, right? But I don't like being cold in the, um, I don't like being cold, right? And I'm cold in the winter because I'm in Chicago. So as best I can, I try not to bring the air conditioner too low. But in my Airbnb down there, the air conditioner goes to like 50. And we have one of those digital, um, thermostats so I can see how um how low you get it and so there's somebody there who literally has it on 50 and I'm like just go someplace cold 50 degrees is just too much too low too low for me and like obviously I don't care but I was just fascinated by the fact that they had it on 50 and they, I can see from the um I can see like on the camera that they really haven't left. So they're just hanging out. And I thought to myself, this is my first time um, really paying attention to it. Last year, I just wasn't very focused on it. Um, that they must not like being hot because they've been inside all day and they don't leave the unit until like seven o'clock. But now that Christian has told me that it's hot, I now understand the reason why not only them, the last people too just hung out. Um, so we're going to get started. I am looking for my um, slideshow that I made today. And I asked y'all how y'all are doing. And I did not share. I am doing really good. Actually, today is day three of the challenge. Um, and I love doing this work, right? So 
and I know people say, oh, they love doing things and often it's a little facetious, but let me explain to you why I love doing this. So when I got into short-term rentals, um, I did it, and this is also me telling you about me. So when I got into short-term rentals initially, it was out of dire necessity. I was desperate, got fired from my job. And in a way, like in hindsight, it really just cracked my confidence because I've always been someone to get a job, keep a job, never been fired. I've quit, right? But I just have never felt um, so challenged by my circumstances. Like even when I didn't have money, I never really felt like a failure. And so in the midst of me being not only sick and a pandemic, it really took a toll on me um, emotionally because it just felt like punishment. And I'd watched so many times celebrities will say like, oh, I was sleeping in my car or I was, you know, I kept getting fired from temp jobs or like just these really negative circumstances. And they always stuck out in my mind, but I, I never thought that would happen to me, right? I'm intelligent, y'all. I'm capable. I am a smart worker. So I never thought for a single second that I'd be one of those people who were just like the stories that I'd heard over and over again. And I never thought, right, especially if I'd ever end up in that situation, that I'd end up doing something completely different ever. I always assumed that like, if I got fired from a job, I would just get another one. And so when I jumped into Airbnb, it was, you know, basically I got fired from my job because I was sick and I shouldn't even say I was sick. My doctor told me I couldn't go back. So I wasn't ready to go back to work. And, and in hindsight, I was probably going to quit anyway, but they just forced me out. And what Airbnb did for me and what it can do for anybody is it gave me financial security in a way that I never had. What do I mean? I mean that like, I never thought about getting, let me ask you, has anybody been fired from a job? Yesterday I asked, had anybody quit? Has anybody been fired from a job? Um, being fired is humiliating. Um, and it's especially humiliating when you feel like you've worked so hard for a company and you're making them money. I was a top earner, okay? I was a top commission earner. And to be fired, like, I was one of your best. I just needed some time, you know, like, and then to just feel like a number was humiliating and it was very devaluing. And I decided that Airbnb was never gonna be like my choice. It was necessity, right? But if you've been in a position where you feel like quitting or you feel like, you know, maybe you've been laid off or, you know, you wanna quit or they've cut your hours or you're feeling forced out, um, that's where the growth happens, right? Like that's when you should bet on yourself that's when you should take the most risk. I know that sounds counterintuitive, but if you get fired from your job, take all the risk. The worst thing that's already happened, it's gonna happen. Take the risk, figure it out. Invest in yourself, double up, right? Receive your double portion. Both hands can receive because they are empty now. Um, and I didn't get that. So that first month, you know, I replaced my corporate income and even still then, I didn't get it. So like for everybody who's in this room, who's thinking maybe they should or shouldn't do Airbnb, like something called you to this room. And you gotta know, you gotta believe and receive that like if you're in this room with this, this community, right? So not just on Zoom, but also on Facebook, you're here for a reason. Like this is literally your time to start, your time to act, your time to receive, right? Um, because it's not an accident. I, plenty of times, anytime my friend, anytime anybody needs some extra money and lose a job, I would always say Airbnb. And that's because my ex and I had a house and it was my dream home and we broke up and neither one of us wanted to break up. We had to break up because we were just not getting along, but we didn't want to give up the house, right? Whatever. I was young. It is what it is. So we airbnb out the house and it made money. So it's funny how even then when I was still at, you know, we had to move out the house. It was a transitional period in my life. Airbnb saved us both the heartache of having to sell the house because we weren't ready. And so here I was again, 
in the midst of a storm that everybody was having a storm, right? Like 2020 was perfect for no one. Everybody experienced some discomfort in 2020. But for me, it felt very personal. And to go from this very negative, unsure, insecure place to in one month replacing my income, you couldn't have convinced me that that was the case. And then to double my corporate income, what? What? Mind you, like, I was just trying to keep a roof over my head and to go from being fired, right? Humiliated. You know, I'm the one, I'm, I'm the six-figure friend, okay? I've been a six-figure friend for a long time. So to go from being, oh, oh, and all my friends are six-figure friends, right? So we all get money. We travel together. We, we, we get extra guac, okay? Like, that's us. And so to now feel like humiliated by my job, ousted, and then also feel like an outsider, right? Um, in my own friend group, when I need my friends the most, I think that like, in a way, it was a good thing that I felt ousted because it got me really serious about getting back, right? Like you are the company you keep. I don't want my friends having fun without me, right? So I got to figure it out. And as I started like really understanding Airbnb, because unlike everybody in this room, I wasn't smart like y'all. I didn't know that you could make money on Airbnb. Nobody in my ecosystem was doing Airbnb. Two years ago, most of my friends were still in corporate America. Now most of us are entrepreneurs doing different things, but I didn't have the secret sauce. I didn't have the recipe, okay? I didn't know. So you guys are all much smarter than me and so much further ahead than I could ever hope to be. And to fast forward, right, to making money and then having my business go six figures in the first year, y'all, what? <laughs> like, that don't make no sense. <laughs> like, I still pinch myself sometimes and I'm like, this is my life. Like, this is me. Like, I get to be in this space. And more than that, I get to share it with y'all. If you've ever attended any of my lives besides this challenge, I answer every question. If I don't have an answer, I don't. But I answer every question. Even the questions I probably should make y'all pay me for, I answer those questions. And the reason why I'm so serious about it is because I don't believe that you should have to feel desperate for knowledge, right? As a woman of color, okay, um, I know how serious it is that we now have access to education, right? Like I, we've all, we all here understand that. I don't, have to, I don't have to do that history lesson for you. And so as I am making money, all I wanna do is help other people make money. And so these challenges for me are an opportunity to not just like build community, but to fully understand like how I can help more people because there's so much room to grow in short-term rentals. And I've, I've said this before, if you have not been here the last few days, I, I'm a super host, right? Airbnb is how I know you can find me. But please understand that my six-figure short-term rental business, about 40, 40 to 45% of that comes from Airbnb. Most of my money doesn't come from Airbnb. It comes from lots of different vehicles, right? So it, the short-term rental traditionally is like vacation rentals, but I've hacked the system, right? So I do insurance connections. I do some nurses, but I, I usually try to work directly with companies versus individuals because I found that like my income um, was more consistent. And, you know, year over year, I've actually made more money. My first year, I was like 95% Airbnb. I still did great, but I'm on, I'm on pace to make at least 30% more than I did when I first got started because I have figured out that Airbnb is a marketplace. And so my fear in this, and this is me being transparent because I talked about your fear. So today we can talk a little bit about mine. I was very afraid that what would happen for me is I would get into Airbnb and get stuck, right? So the platform would eventually get purchased or something. And then where would I go? How would I make money? Because again, for me, this is not just um, a hustle. Like this has to work for me. And so that's when I started getting curious about how can I host people short term in a way that like is meaningful to me. And so that's why I'm here. That's why I do this. Um, that's why if you're on my email list, I encourage you to come with questions because I don't want to leave um, anybody out and I don't want to leave anybody behind. And 
it's really important for me to make sure that as best I can, I can carry as many people with me who are willing to be carried, right? Like who are willing to help themselves. And so my mission has been very clear from the beginning, help people who are willing to help themselves. So I appreciate all of you all for rocking with me, especially those of you who have been here for three days. It means more than me I can say. Um, to those of you who have signed up, I'm excited to work with y'all. I can't wait till next week so we can meet in our small group. Um, lots of fun gonna happen there. Um, so let's get going. I know that a couple of people wrote comments. So let me read their comments really quick over on Facebook. Um, Jackie said, where is the camera placed? Oh no, what's wrong with the camera, Jackie? What do you see? Y'all see something wrong, please tell me. <laughs> um, but the camera is placed uh, right in front of me. I guess, is that your, is that your question? Um, am I familiar with Shelby King's, Shelby and King's Mountain, North Carolina? A little bit. I don't know, Jackie has me nervous because she asked me, where's the camera? So I'm worried that like, I don't know what she could possibly see, but <laughs> okay, she'll tell me. Um, Angel, actually, one of my good friends, left corporate America with only two months safety net. It's possible to leave your nine to five and get into business for yourself. Somebody else who has quit their job. Um, she said extra guac. Oh yeah, we are definitely the extra guac crew all day, every day. Um, how many Airbnbs did you have to make six figures in your first year? Um, three and a half. So I, uh, that's a strange, the half part is gonna confuse you guys. But I do, and I'm in an investment group that invests in Airbnbs. And so I have portions of other Airbnbs. Um, a bulk of that came from two of my Airbnbs, but one of them was like my actual home. And it's a three bedroom in downtown Chicago. So I charge a premium. So like in the summertime, it makes like 11,000 a month. Um, so, you know, the rest of the year does really well, but specifically the summertime from like April to October, I make a killing. And then those other months I'm looking for ways to make money. And we'll talk about that a little bit today too. Oh, you were asking, where's my camera, my Airbnb? Oh, okay. It's over the front door. It's, a, it's illegal to put it anywhere else. And I get a notification every time the door opens and closes. Well, my property manager does, but I'm still me. So I look, um, it's over the door. It's over the front door, the back door. It's not over windows. And the reason why it's not over windows, you can put them over windows, but people undress with the blinds open. And I would feel terrible if I accidentally reported someone who was undressed. So I don't put them there. Um, if you happen to come out the front door naked, that's not on me. Um, do I invest in REITs? REITs are real estate investment trust. Um, in the, from a stock perspective, yes, I do invest in um, equity stocks that are REITs. Um, I'm actually heavily leveraged in REITs. I should probably um, realign my portfolio, but I'm busy. So it is what it is. Um, but no, I have a group of friends and we invest in short-term rentals and we do them um, um, Typically we do like four or five units to try to work with one property manager to acquire them, which is what I share with you guys. Like I said, if you're doing it by yourself, maybe get a few friends, you guys can form an LLC or a corporation, depending on how you want to pay yourselves. And you can approach landlords to get multiple units. And so we did that and it works out really well. I do nothing but collect the check every month. Like I have no nothing in those other than residual income. Yeah, I knew my guests were home because I get a notification every time the door opens and closes. That's it. And they just, the door hadn't opened all day. And sometimes I get a little curious if it doesn't open all day, I'll send out a quick wellness message to ask them how things are going. Um, people typically don't stay in Airbnbs all day long, but because I'm out of town, my property managers are all local, but because I'm out of town, I will check in to make sure people are okay. And so, and also the air conditioning was at 50 and I was like, okay, lots of things are happening. So I knew that they were there, but I do check. Um, can you rent an Airbnb without owning the house? Absolutely, Christian. That's what we're going to talk about today. When you said three and a half Airbnbs, how do you invest in other people's Airbnbs? Um, Kessica, technically they are our, they are our, ooh, that was hard, Airbnbs. <laughs> um, we invest and I have a portion of them. And so I just say half because technically I have one fourth 
of a couple of them. So that's what makes them a half. Does that make sense? And then let me check Zoom really quick to see what your comments are. Um, Ebony says she's never been fired. Oh, Lord, that's 103 in Virginia, baby. 103 degrees? No, ma'am. <laughs> no, ma'am. Um, I went to Vegas one summer. It was 103. And I, yeah, no, no, no thank you. Um, Ebony says she was let go of her job of seven years when the pandemic hit. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's terrible. You've been fired from a job I gave my all to, so I know the feeling. That's Janelle. She said that she'd gotten fired. So y'all feel me, like it's humiliating. Even if you hated the job, it's humiliating. It's like being in a relationship with somebody and you're like, I'm gonna break up, I'm gonna break up. And then they break up with you. You're like, but wait, I was gonna leave first. How dare you? But you know, whatever, it happens. Um, Jada said, how much does she need to start? It depends on your state. So typically first, last security. In Chicago, they can't charge you that. They can only charge you rent of the first month that you are renting and then also an application fee or a security deposit. So it depends on where you live. That question is kind of hard to answer. Um, and then for furnishing, you can have, you could be low on cash and use credit. You can pull down cash from credit cards and you should fi I, I finance my furniture and i usually pay it off really quickly you can finance to like ashley Furniture for ashley furniture your local furniture company usually has more favorable uh financing and they have inventory and stock so as best i can i try to go visit local furniture stores to see like what the inventory is and what i like so that i can buy it from them and typically they have local delivery so you don't have to worry about that and usually for some nominal fee of like $69 or $79, they'll assemble whatever you have. And if you're nice to them, and you have a little something extra for them to put together, you give them an extra 20, they'll do that too. I'm a hustler. So usually I anticipate asking to put a couple other things together. And for the most part, I've had positive results. How do you find property managers? Um, there are apps that have property managers. There are also, um, Christina saying she's a co-host. So there's apps that you can find property managers. Google is also a really good source. Um, local Facebook groups. So the Chicago host Facebook group, excellent. People usually share their property manager. Um, real estate agents typically, if they are not one, they know one. And in some states, you have to be a real estate agent or realtor to be a property manager. I wanna say, don't quote me on this. I think Texas, that might be the case or Florida, one of those hot states you have to be a real estate agent. And some cities require that too. Um, so it's always good that if you can reach out to um, a local realtor to see if they know one, they typically do. And that's just their industry, they usually do. Um, Jada says she's from Chicago. Okay, um, so Jada, just your first month rent and then your furnishing cost and furnishing costs just vary on how big the, the, um, the unit is. Um, does your credit score have an effect on getting finance? Um, a lot of furniture stores, local ones, have some of the big ones too, but most of the local ones have things where you can just show proof of income. And sometimes proof of income and or, well, what is it called? There's another one where you can show the money in your bank account and they'll let you borrow, essentially borrow against what's in your bank account. So if you have $5,000, they'll give you like 80% of that to use at the furniture store. I cannot, I keep on to call it marshmallow, but I made that up. When I think of the term, I'll tell you, but essentially you can borrow against what's in the account or um, what you have as um, collateral. And then somebody else said 50, they keep a dead bodies cold. <laughs> Jackie, they probably are keeping dead bodies cold. <laughs> Just kidding, hopefully not. I know they aren't though. Again, I get a notification every time. So there've been no big bags coming in and out of there. Um, Lisa is a realtor and she's also confirming that realtors know property managers and or a lot of them are property managers, but Christina is on Zoom and Christina, when you get finished, you should probably go on Facebook and tag yourself so people can see you that you are co-host. Co-host is another term for property manager. Um, oh, thank you, Janelle. You know, Denisha, I know Denisha. She said Denisha Boone is a property manager here in Chicago. She's also an amazing realtor. Um, should you rent a property in your name? Shanika, the short answer to that question is my first property was in my name. There is some risk associated with that. 
Um, I can't tell you no. I can tell you that it is a less risky option to put the business, to put it in your business name. But a lot of people will have to put it in their own name and their business name because the business doesn't have any credit. Some of the things that you can do that will help you work around it is, oh, you said Denisha is your homie. Denisha has a fan club. I should text her and tell her. Um, sorry. One of the things you can do is, per, it's like double indemnification, meaning that you and the business are both responsible. You can park money in your bank account and park means put the money in there and don't touch it. Leave it for a couple of months so that as you're going with the properties, they'll want two or three months of bank statements. Your business will have the two or three months of balance that they're looking for. So that's another way around it, especially as you're building business credit. Um, Candace also has a co-hosting business. She loves it and is looking for other hosts that can use her services. What's the best way? Um, Candace, uh, I said this before, I'll say this again, go into your local uh, Facebook hosting groups. And there's also property management groups. There's cleaning groups. Um, if you have access to cleaners, when people post about cleaners, you can absolutely tell them you have one and pitch your property management services. Um, that's a great way to get in. And I think that for co-hosts or anybody who's looking to expand their Airbnb business beyond just being a host, being a co-host is a great option. You should try to hoard as many good sources, resources as you can. So talking to cleaners, interviewing them, taking their information. And then like when somebody needs a cleaner, you activate, right? You are a solution for someone and you're meeting a need immediately. It makes you much more marketable. It also can get you access to addresses and um, properties that allow Airbnb that you wouldn't ordinarily have, right? So you may be thinking about a year from now, I want to be a host right now, I'm a co-host. Well, if you do property management, you have the king's lot of options because people are going to tell you where it is. They'll say like, I'm on the north side of Chicago. Is that too far for you? Or I'm in Manhattan. Is that too far for you? And like, you can just start to build up resources that way. Um, so I think I've answered everyone. Oh, how do you get started being a co-host property manager? I feel like I just answered that, Lydia. If not, let me know. I will be happy to answer that question. So let's talk landlord arbitrage. And so this is day two. And like I said, I want to do something a little bit different. Um, typically, it's just me on camera. But I am going to go on Canva and show you guys a slide presentation. It'll be a brief overview of what we've already discussed. Um, and then I'll get to the last half. So yesterday, we talked about a few steps. Today, we'll talk about those last few steps. And then whoever wants to hang out, I'll answer questions. And then um, I dropped the Zoom link, I'll drop it again. I promised y'all I would talk about my script. I'll give y'all maybe two minutes of my script and like what I do. I'm not gonna do that on Facebook because I'm leaving up the Facebook replay. So when it's time for me to hop off of here, I will give you guys a Zoom link to come over to Zoom to look at the script, but I won't do that on Facebook just because if people wanna get the script, they should join the course. Okay. Um, one last question. Shanita said, can you be a co-host without being a host? I don't plan on starting my Airbnb. Yeah, absolutely. Most people who are um, co-hosts are not hosts first. I'll tell you that the journey is a little bit um, harder because people want to, if they are a super host, they want to stay a super host. And so super hosts get priority over non-super host. So just keep that in mind. Um, I would make myself very marketable. I'd make it like too sexy to say no to. I dress it up real nice for my first client. I would just obviously not give it away because you're gonna have to use your time, but I'll make myself so competitive um, that it would be impossible to say no. Free game. I would say something like, okay, in addition to the services I offer you, I want to increase the value of your unit. So I want to offer an experience. So what I'll do is on Saturdays, I can do a walking tour of the tobacco district in my area. I made that up, all right? But if it's something that you know enough about, go ahead and offer that up so that they can be more marketable to guests 
And then it makes you more marketable to them because offering experiences is a game changer. Or you can um, be Turo. You can say, I know that you have this Airbnb. I also offer Turo. We can make you more marketable by offering a car to go along with your Airbnb unit. There's about a dozen different ways that you can make yourself more marketable to be a co-host. Um, that's just one of them or a couple of them. All right, let me share my screen. I'm gonna check Facebook one more time. Um, you're welcome, Candace. You're welcome, Shanita. Let's see. All right, so when I go on Canva, full disclosure, um, feel free to drop your questions. I will answer them, but it's harder for me to see them when I'm in Canva because Canva takes up most of the screen. And I'm gonna, if you weren't here yesterday, don't be alarmed, the replay is still up but I am going to go through them pretty quickly so that I can get you guys out of here as close to um, seven o'clock as possible. Yes, Christian, I love that you've heard of Turo. And also in my, um, in my course, I have a Turo coach who comes in and talks to you guys about Turo. Can you all see my screen? Can, I, can somebody just drop a one and tell me they can see my screen? It can be on Facebook or on Zoom. Okay, thank you, Bree. Thank you, Shanita. And let me check on Facebook to make sure that you guys can see. Okay, Christian said, yes, you can see. Okay, perfect. So yesterday we went over this. Um, that's just my face. <laughs> um, okay, so we're gonna start from the beginning, all right? You're here because you're ready to start your Airbnb without owning property. If that's you, can you drop a yes? That'd be helpful. I know that you guys are all yeses, but I like to reinforce that. You guys know I'm all about manifesting and speaking things into existence. So I expect 50 yeses from you guys. <laughs> um, I'm Chanel Rose, if you did not know that. And I teach ambitious entrepreneurs how to grow their Airbnb business without owning property and low startup costs. Remember y'all, I was fired and hadn't been paid for two months. So everything that I did was designed to make me money without me having to spend too much money. 2020, we talked about this. I was underpaid, exhausted, stressed, full of impossible imposter syndrome, just in a bad space, right? And then just when I thought that 2020 couldn't kick my butt, it went up to me. You gotta be careful when you tell God that it can't get worse, because it can. Um, but then, you know, through Airbnb, because I started my Airbnb very early, things turned around for me really, really fast. I, I found my confidence. I started to feel like an authority because I, you know, my system was working. I got happy again. You know, I hadn't been happy in years. Like I'm happy every day. Sometimes things are stressful, but I am happy every day. Um, I found my six figures through short-term rentals and I get to do things on my own terms, which is much more important to me than anything I can ask for is the ability to live my life my way. Um, and for the first time, I feel like I have time and financial freedom. I've never had both. When I had time freedom, I was unemployed. And when I had financial freedom, I had no time. <laughs> so now I get the sweet spot in life every day. And I Airbnb for a lot of reasons, but why Airbnb, right? This is a perfect example of income. I spend less than eight minutes a person on my Airbnb clients. Like I look at the app, right? But like, I don't spend time doing anything. If they don't say anything to me all day, I'm fine with that. But like all my stuff is automated. So let me know, drop a one if you would like to make, you know, $1,400 and you spend at the most 16 minutes interacting with those people. Cause maybe you want to work, but I didn't want to work. So I just need a one from y'all. If that sounds like good 16 and it's easy. I'm not doing nothing. I don't have to like, I don't clean. I charge a cleaning fee. So that doesn't come out of my pocket, right? I don't do anything for my short-term rentals unless there's something that happens, which it so rarely does. There, I can go a whole week and all I do is check the app. And half the time I'm just checking to make sure my money came through. Like I don't do anything. And I've said this to you before um, and I make an average of $6,000 a month with just one of my Airbnbs. Um, and I'm healthier than I've ever been. And I'm in a career that I love. I can't emphasize enough. I love this work. And I'm so happy to love what I do. Um, I don't want to brag, but when I tell y'all that I'm a super host, I literally have 100% five stars. I'm not a super host, I'm the super host consistently. And it's not because 
of anything other than the fact that I'm really good at what I do and I know how to please my guests. And that's why I lean into you all so heavy about understanding who you want to host, what you want to do. So not only am I making passive money, which is fine, right? Because there's lots of people who make money on Airbnb, but I'm a super host with a five-star rating over and over again. And it's been this way for a long time. And I told y'all I've had issues. I told y'all I had a flood with a guest in my unit. I still have five stars. That's not by accident. Um, when you learn from me, you literally learn from somebody who consistently exceeds expectations, who consistently um, meets the needs of whoever it is that they're trying to work with. It's not on accident. When I tell you guys that I understand landlord arbitrage, y'all think if I can please the cranky guest, I can't get a landlord to say yes to me? Come on, let's do the math here, right? Like, this is not anything other than divine design. I had to brag a little bit, y'all, because every time I get to that slide, I'm like, yes. Yes, I am as good as I think I am. Um, and hopefully you guys feel that way about yourselves too. If you don't, please start thinking about how you can start to think about yourself as the best because you are. Um, these are the four steps we talked about yesterday. Identify, approach, negotiate, sign. Those are the four steps for landlord arbitrage. You go through that same cycle over and over again. You identify the property, you approach the landlord, you negotiate the lease, you sign the lease. If nothing else resonates, those are your four steps. Identify. We talked about this yesterday, so I won't stay here too long. Um, identify. Find your location. You research that location. You leverage what you have to understand how your guests will appreciate that location. Does anybody have questions about this step? Do you understand the research part? We talked about air DNA. We talked about why people would come there day one. Everybody gave me a city and they told me why people go visit that city. Um, the math is always exactly the same. Two plus two is always four in this equation. There's no gimmicks. Um, the identify stage is probably the one that most of you guys are stuck at because people constantly tell me, Chanel, how do I find a profitable location? Air DNA, Airbnb, excuse me, Air DNA, MASH Visor, and even Airbnb. Look around and see, are there already units there? How much are people making? Is that going to be enough for you? That's the piece that I've been to dozens of master classes, and no one ever says that last piece, which is, are they making enough for you? Is $300 a month enough passive income for you? It might be, right? Um, it might not be, but if you're doing the research, maybe some of that like resistance that you have in your spirit is because it's not enough for you and that's okay. Uh, maybe you need to figure out how you're gonna scale to six units or 15 units to get where you need to be if that's the city where you've decided you wanna stay in. Or maybe you need to save a little bit more or spend a little bit more so that you can make more. That's up to you. I don't know everybody's individual story. I pay a lot of money in rent. For my unit that makes me a lot of money, I spend quite a bit of money in rent. Um, approaching the landlords. Yesterday, and let me ask this question again, because I see a lot of new names. What is your fear about landlord arbitrage? Is it being told no? Is it being unsure about what to say? Is it like, what is it that's your hesitation? Because I see a lot of you all weren't here yesterday. I want to make sure that we address that. But there is a simple art in the approach. Um, planning, okay? You have to have a plan for how you approach people. I said this yesterday. Um, I, on average, will message like 20 people a day. And I just sit there and I'm just message after message after message after message. I'm like a machine. And I don't care. Like, I just keep doing it until I start getting responses. And then from those responses, I start to make decisions about which one do I want to tour? Which one would I like to be in? And I start getting serious. But I have no emotional attachment to a single place. There are some I like more than others, but I have zero emotional attachment. I do not care about... Um, I don't fall in love with them is what I'm trying to say. And so oftentimes as new business owners, we need to fall in love. Oh, well, I don't like those light fixtures. Switch them out. I don't like those handles. Switch them out. I don't like that paint. Paint. It's a business. It's not a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a they friend. It's a business. Businesses have no gender. They have no emotions. They will do exactly what you tell them to. 
organized. I have a spreadsheet that lets me know every person who I've reached out to, every property, what I like, what I don't like. Contact the person. This is where people get stuck. They contact three people, don't hear back. It's not online dating, y'all. It's not. This is a business relationship. You contact people. There are times you have to contact them again and again and again. And sometimes you have to send them a message, send them an email, and call them on the phone. It doesn't just end with that first contact. But so many people take that non-response as a rejection, and then they just decide that they don't want to do it no more. It's too hard. Y'all probably send 100 text messages a day. I'm not trying to hear it. You probably send 100 DMs a day for you and your friends. I bet you your group text is lit all the time. Send one less text. You know, you don't have to be witty with them. Get to your money. It's that simple. The contact is a volume game. The contact is not the finesse. The finesse comes in much later. Following up, this is where 99.9% of the people fail. They will do the hard work of, you know, planning, organizing, contacting, go to a tour. And then when they finish the tour, the person doesn't follow up with them, so they don't follow up. Don't you want the money? If they have what you want, follow up. But just like going on a job interview and not following up with a thank you or not following up in a few days to see the status of the job. Sometimes you eliminate yourself from the list because you're not relevant. If you're not following up, you're no longer relevant. They assume as the person with the goods that you don't want it. So you have to follow up, okay? Negotiation. Every part of your lease, except for the address and the size, is negotiable. Um, you can negotiate the length of the lease. For example, um, we have a unit that we really wanted in my investment group. And we decided that instead of doing our standard 12 month lease, we have an 18 month lease, but we knew that what we could do to it would make us money and it would make the most sense for what we were trying to achieve. So we have an 18 month lease. You can agree to pay more months rent up front to be more favorable. Um, you can negotiate just about every part of your lease. And the most important part, if you are in lease signing stage, you need to make sure that you have an addendum, which is an addition, addendum is an addition to the lease that explicitly states that you can have short-term rental guests in their unit. And you have to make sure, because what you'll do is you'll ask for the short-term rental addendum. They may come back and make adjustments, right? You need to make sure that it clearly states that you can do that because you may get a handshake deal from um, a property manager or a realtor, but you might not have explicit permission from the landlord. And so what can happen is somebody can say, yeah, sure, sure, Airbnb, whenever you want to. And then the owner finds out and you're facing eviction because you didn't do your due diligence. So make sure that you have an, a lease addendum that explicitly states what you're trying to do. You have the power. As a landlord, vacancies cost me money. I need to make money. I don't make any money if no one's in my unit. So you need to know that if they have a vacancy every single day that they have a vacancy, it costs you money. That should give you confidence. You have the money. You have all the power in the relationship, all the power. We approach landlord arbitrage with the mindset that the landlord or the property manager or the property has the power. They don't. They have the least power because they're in debt, right? And so you're trying to get them out of debt by creating a business partnership with them. So every single time you approach this, you need to know, I have the power. I am the value. Every time, you may have to say that to yourself. I am the power. I have the value, right? Like every single time. It doesn't matter what they may tell you. This is the truth. Landlords want to make money in the signing, okay? Make sure you review your lease. In most cities now, they have a standard lease and inside of that standard lease, um, Airbnb, it, it, there's like a box you can check that says Airbnb, yes or no, okay? Um, even if you have a lease addendum, default will be that it says you can't Airbnb. You need to get them to uncheck that. Had a client who signed a lease with a lease addendum that said they could and the lease said they couldn't. Why do you care? 
Well, they changed property managers and the property managers were like, well, the addendum is not the lease. So we have to honor the lease. And so they had to stop Airbnb. And luckily they were nice enough to let them finish out like a couple of months of bookings, but they couldn't add any more. So they had to share their calendar with their property manager and they ended up just barely breaking even. But again, like make sure that when you look at the lease that that box is not checked. Can I get a yes that you're gonna review your lease so that I know that you all are paying attention? Just a simple yes so that you understand that like you must review your lease. It's no longer, you're just a tenant, you don't care, you sign. This is your business, this is your livelihood. You have to make sure that you do everything. And you also want to confirm, okay? Confirm that everything that you guys have discussed um, is what you thought it was going to be, including things like um, if you're going to share a property manager, then what is that? What are those property managers' duties, right? Because sometimes property management is trash, snow removal, and grass cutting. It includes zero maintenance. You might be responsible for your maintenance, especially with a private landlord. So please make sure that you understand what the maintenance relationship covers because you might be excited about that place, but it may be a bad fit for you. And if they don't have a property manager that does maintenance, then please ask them, if I pay, what is your reimbursement process? Do you reimburse me directly or should I just reduce it from the rent? That's really important. I have a relationship with one of my landlords where I pay and I just take it out the rent. I never get reimbursed. And so all I do is when I pay the rent, I send them um, all of the receipts that I have for whatever needed to be fixed. And I've only had to fix like small things. Um, and then what ends up happening is I just reduce it from the rent. So it's never, it's like 50 bucks, but still to be clear, you need to make sure that you understand what you're signing because your business relies on you being um, persistent all the time. Oh, what happened? Okay, sorry, y'all. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I wanna go back. What are your questions? Because I know that we are at that part, we've talked a lot about landlord arbitrage and I wanna make sure that I am addressing you all directly. I got a bunch of yeses. Thank you, Facebook. A bunch of yeses. Thank you, um, Zoom. What is your hesitation right now? Because I've told you everything you need to know. Oh, I'm getting lots of hearts. You guys are the best. <laughs> um, lots of hearts, but did you guys tell me your fears? Anybody, was anybody brave enough to tell me their fears? Um, okay. So Jackie said her soul struggles with Airbnb. Everybody and their mothers are doing it, creating it, or at least adding to the housing shortage. Um, the math is like this example. An apartment in my town will be rented for say $1,500 a month. Airbnb owners are wanting it to make $1,500 a week. Ergo, so Jackie, that's not, how do I explain this? So in most cases, the housing shortage that is described is, let's go back even further, so many things. The housing shortage that people are usually describing are directly related to affordability and not actual um, availability of housing. If you get on any website, there's hundreds of places that are for rent all the time and sometimes dozens in each community. Um, the housing shortage is a big, 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 big concept, but a lot of places that have um, housing shortages, it's really about affordability and access to affordability. And so there's usually a cost of living um, increase that doesn't exist. There are lots of variables that go into lack of housing. Um, what you'd be doing at Airbnb would probably be a place that's like high tourism, probably more expensive, and typically they don't have housing shortages. And somebody's gonna say, well, yeah, well, houses are flying off the market and people are staying put. Well, people are staying put because it's a pandemic. And um, interest rates, so many things. One, millennials are in their prime buying years for homes, okay? Interest rates are very favorable. 
So there's more people looking to buy homes. And there are also a lot of people who are doing what's called staying put because we're in a pandemic. And then you also have to consider, in addition to that, people who have homes who they want to sell that need work, a lot of them want to invest in it to get a higher ROI. And there is a shortage of materials and skilled workers. So that stuff is related to the quote unquote housing shortage. There is a supply chain issue that is existing here. Like a lot of construction companies are something like 18 months behind where they're supposed to be. We are probably at minimum 10 years away from catching up to our housing shortage. But there's so many variables to what people would call a housing shortage, but it's access to affordable housing. And to be quite frank, quite frank, um, there's always been a housing shortage in America. That's why we had um, housing projects. Access to affordable housing has been an ongoing issue because the lower income that you make, the less you can actually afford to house your family, right? And so there are a lot of people who have been displaced, who literally have been displaced because of cost. So I hope that that provides some insight for you. Um, and maybe you read that article in New York that said that um, there's more Airbnb listings than there are apartments for rent. <sighs> okay, the short answer to that since we're here is people list their house and don't rent it. People list their house because they're on holiday. People rent list their house because they're curious about it. Um, and number of listings does not actually equal number of hosts. Um, and because like one person can have several listings, right? And then have a three bedroom. I can list my three bedroom. I can list each one of those bedrooms. So that one apartment can be four listings, right? So no one's aggregating the data to actually account for those kind of things. When I looked at the research, that math wasn't there. Quite a few people do that. And then there's also, you know, the fact that some people do it seasonally, right? People in Chicago will Airbnb out their house in the summer and go someplace else, but they don't Airbnb all year round. So keep in mind that there are lots of variables for that. Um, thank you, Sharon. Um, you think that your Airbnb is not getting enough bookings? Why do you think that? Um, Sharon says, you don't believe that arbitrage is accepted here. And I'm afraid I'll have pushback from landlords. I'm concerned about running into legislation that will prevent me from doing it. Are you in Toronto? The legislation is very clear. As long as you're doing it legally, um, they have a client in Toronto. As long as you're doing it legally, you won't have any issues. Um, arbitrage is legal. It is a little bit harder, but it is legal in Toronto. I've had to check that I have a client there. Um, and then let's see, what are we saying on... Okay, Shanita said, I want to get a property in Virginia Beach where tons of tour, tons of tourists vacation. I saw a property permit for 900. Is it a rule of thumb to add 500 to the rent and then go from there? Um, what do you mean a rule of thumb? Add 500 to the rent for like incidentals or $500 because that's what you plan to make? I'm not sure what the question is. If you could expand for me, I'm happy um, to help. Um, you missed the stuff for how to become a co-host. Can you explain? I'm interested in being a co-host property manager then become an Airbnb host. So step one would be, and you can do this a bunch of different ways. I would go into my local group. So let's say you're in DC, right? Local people get priority over everybody else. So you could be a super host in New York City, but if you're in DC, somebody's going to want you to be um, in, D in DC because if something happens, they need you to go there. Um, I would... If you're not already a super host, or you're not already a host, I would create a website that speaks to my value as a professional, as a practitioner, as an individual. I would make sure that people understand why I would be a great um, co-host. Like you have access to plumbers or electricians because you are one or because you have people in your ecosystem who can help market yourself so, so, so niche down that people understand that you want to work with, you only work in downtown Chicago or you only work in this area. And these are the type of people that you prefer to service and just get really clear. That's the first piece. And then going in these Facebook groups and talking to people because people will ask for property managers all the time, all the time. Um, there's also 
apps that you can put yourself on, property management apps that are specifically for Airbnb that you can do it. Another great way to become a co-host is to be a cleaner. If you're not a cleaner, having a cleaning company is a great way because you're already in their house. If you're willing to manage it and also just charge them a fee, people will pay it. And most people rely on their cleaner to be a de facto property manager because the cleaner knows everything that's happening. And so they will rely on them to tell them what's happening. Okay. So I don't own my property in Chicago, Farron. What are the requirements of the Airbnb if you want to do arbitrage? What, um, what would the property owner need to do? I want to be clear in my pictures to them, all the details. Okay, Farron, you should take the course because that is a, that's a lot. I could not pack that all up in, um, uh oh, I just stepped on my keyboard. Um, I cannot unpack all of that here. I guess I can answer this question succinctly. You should articulate your value and be very clear about why you'd be a good business partner to them. If you're approaching a, a landlord directly, look them up on Facebook, look them up on LinkedIn, look them up and see like, do you guys have things in common? I know that sounds you know, counterintuitive, but if you took the time to research me and don't be a creep, right? Like don't be like, yeah, I love your wife's red bottoms. Don't bring up people who aren't in the room. Um, but you can say like, oh, you know, we both went to Columbia University. Um, what did you study while you were there? You can say, I looked you up on LinkedIn. I'm so excited that you and I have these things in common. And the same thing with the realtor. You get to know those folks and have something in common. Um, you should, again, if you weren't here yesterday before I talked about like how to manage risk and they care about some specific things, but the example I gave was they're concerned about property damage. Talk to them about your insurance. Air cover has a million dollars in coverage. Verbo provides a million dollars in coverage and you will have an additional $500,000 in coverage from State Farm. Your average renter has $100,000 in coverage. I would have 15 to 20 times the amount of coverage. And unlike your average renter who would let your ceiling leak for three months, we know within hours that something's going on with your property and we can address each issue as it arises. That would just always keep your property in selling condition. That's what they care about, right? And there are a few other things that landlords care deeply about, but if you want to get into the psyche of a landlord, just thinking about why somebody want to own property and why would they be scared to rent the property on Airbnb? And then you just speak to those things confidently. And that's going to be the biggest thing. Like, don't waver, don't fold, right? Make sure that they understand that you're going to be the best business partner. So when I approach it, I don't say tenant. I, I would like this partnership with you because I have done the math and I'll even tell them, like I've done the math and based on your location, I think that, you know, having a short-term rental here would be great for you because it diversifies the way that you earn income because I am not just a personal tenant. I am now a business tenant without you having to, you know, change the regulations or move your business. I'm another way that you make, I'm another way that you earn money in your portfolio. I know the diversification is very important to, real estate investors, right? Like just having the conversation around their needs. Um, you said that's super helpful. Last question. Um, will they need to get the license from the city or would I? Um, you, where, I guess, where are you at? Typically you get the license. I've never seen it where, okay, so, huh. In Chicago, you get the license, but there are some instances where the property owner would need to get the license. Like if you are in a condo building, um, and I guess it just depends. Like some condo buildings require that if you're on Airbnb, the owner of the unit has to get the license and not you. But 80% of the time it is you. What are your other questions, guys? I know you have them. Don't be shy. You guys are a thousand questions yesterday. Don't um, don't give up now. <laughs> I like this. I like Q and A's. What about Facebook? You guys are really quiet tonight. Um, do you have any questions for me? And I know we're gonna. I promised that we would head over to Zoom, but I want to make sure that you all understand that. Of course, I have a course. 
And I would love it if you all were to join me in the course. It, it, I think I shared it, I shared it with you yesterday. If you have any questions, it is unique. And I like to talk about like, why it's unique. Number one, I am a super host, but more than that, I teach you how to make the money and not just how to make the money, how to keep making money. So somebody mentioned that they have a property and they don't think they're getting enough bookings. It happens, right? Not getting bookings is usually for a few reasons. Uh, one of them is pricing. That's usually the biggest one. People do not price themselves to perform. Um, I have found that there's also usually issues with their actual listing. There's a few different reasons why people um, do not get enough bookings, but pricing is usually the first one. I have found that incorrect pricing is not correct. Like that's the level of institutional knowledge you get from me. In addition to that, I don't just leave you at, you know, how to get your unit, which is important, but we talk about what happens when you become a host. We talk about, you know, we do role play of you talking to different landlords as you're going through the arbitrage process. So you can see it, other people can see it. I can give you feedback. Others can give you feedback. Our small group coaching is the difference between mine and most other programs because I've taken other classes and I found that like, yeah, you gave me all this good information, but if I have a question, who do I turn to? Most of the time, nobody, right? Like you're just relying on watching the video over and over again and hoping that you missed a word. My system is literally set up so that you can continue to learn and evolve through the process. It's a five week course, but you're in the group for a year. So for exactly one year, you can come back and ask questions at no extra cost. After that year, you have to pay to stay in the group. But before that year is up, you have essentially, I come on for one hour and I answer whatever questions you have, very similar to this. Occasionally I teach things, but it's really for me to get you guys to start thinking your way through your business plan and what you're trying to grow into, what you're trying to scale into. Most of my clients walk away from my coaching and end up with their Airbnb. Reggie's in talks. Reggie was one of my clients. He's in talks of having his Airbnb. A couple of his cohorts that were in my last group already have their Airbnbs. My client in Toronto is this close to having her Airbnb. Um, the system works a step further. I don't just talk to you about Airbnb. I feel like that's kind of cruel to just tell you about Airbnb. I talk to you about how I've gotten relationships with my local businesses to help me get more bookings, right? Because it's not enough. Like Airbnb is great, but it can't be the only way that you make money every day. Relying on one marketplace or one type of marketplace is the same as having a job. And that essentially was my fear was that I would get into this and I would have to be like, in job mode again, and I didn't want that. And I also teach you about Turo, because why wouldn't you have a Turo car if you have an Airbnb? So people can rent a car from you instead of renting it from Hertz or Enterprise, and you can be what I like to call a full circle service. It creates a really great client experience. Um, Shanita, you said, do I teach how to get Airbnbs internationally? Yeah. I do. The course itself is designed mostly on the States, but I do have clients who have gotten it in the Bahamas um, and Toronto. This is not international, but Puerto Rico. So not on the main 48. And then I have a client I'm working with right now that is getting one in London. And that's a lot of fun because London is nothing like here. And then um, I talked to a woman today that's in Paris. And so Paris has some new regulations that actually make Airbnb a lot more favorable there than most other European countries. And so we're working together to um, figure out how we arbitrage in Paris. So I, I can speak to international um, for the most part. I don't know much about like Nigeria, um, Ghana, like African countries I'm not very familiar with, but for the most part, I can navigate my way through most other countries. Um, Keisha said, did you say we have to have a license to start an Airbnb? Depends on what city you're in. Some cities require that you have an Airbnb license and it's just a like registration thing. Think about registering your car 
it's like registering your Airbnb. So they know that if something happens at that address that it's a short-term rental. And Airbnb knows where that is. And so you won't be able to list your place without it. Um, you said, uh, Kessica said, is there a website or anything to look up regulations for your state? Typically, Airbnb regulations are city specific. So I would just put short-term rental regulations, Chicago. Short-term rental regulations, Houston. Um, and something will come up at almost all, and go to the .gov. So there'll be a .org, a .com, a .co. No, only go to the .gov. If you have any questions, please um, reach out directly to um, that municipality. Do not ask your friends, do not hop in Facebook groups, speak directly to the municipality. You can ask for confirmation in Facebook groups, but the hey, government input- Where did you get that from? Hello, hello, hello. Somebody took themselves off mute. <laughs> um, you wanna reach directly out to that government entity to get the information that you need. And so I am gonna drop the Zoom link one more time, and then I'm going to stop streaming into Facebook. If you are curious about the script, you're gonna to have to head over on Zoom. Um, is Toronto license cost 5,000 CAD? Um, sure, I don't think so. I feel like I, I'm gonna find it and send it over to you. I feel like it was nominal. Um, I don't know, 5,000 CAD. I don't think that's how much it cost. I think it was a lot less than that. Um, and it says, how do you, how does everything work with Turo? Do you offer any packages to rent both? Yep, I give people a discount. So the Turo car that's at my unit is my friend's Maserati. Um, and I think the next one that we, um, he has is a Rolls Royce. Um, and I don't have any interest in having a Rolls Royce or a Maserati today. So I just, we have a partnership where his cars are at my units and they offer a discount to my clients. So instead of paying whatever the normal rate is, I think right now is 20%. That sounds right. So they get a 20% discount to, um, do Turo through our um, listings. And it works out really well. Like I was like on the fence about Turo, but we haven't had any issues. He has never made any complaints. I mean, and he has somebody who manages his cars. I'm not an expert on Turo, um, which is why I bring somebody in to talk, to talk to you about business credit, personal credit and Turo, but you're welcome to, um, if you decide to join the course, there are, is an expert who explains to you like how it works out really well for them. Um, so again, I dropped the link in the chat for those of you who um, are interested. I'm going to stop streaming into Facebook. You guys have been great. Are there any more questions on Facebook before I hop over onto Zoom only and talk about the script? Um, I'm trying to wait to see, did you guys get the link? I guess I should ask, are you coming on to Zoom, anybody? Jessica, Sharon, I'm not sure who else is over here tonight. Um, do you guys have Zoom? Let me know before I hang up. But somebody just asked a question on Zoom. What's your question? Your cousin does, does Turo. You just heard about it for the first time last year. Okay. Um, it works. It works, like people who do Turo really, really like it. Um, I thought about doing Turo, my hesitation for Turo was purely, um, I don't like maintenance. I don't even like taking my own car to the shop. My boyfriend takes the car to the shop. But I knew that Turo would have to be like a passive thing for me, like I invested, somebody else manages it, because I didn't want to do any of that kind of work. I'm just being honest. Um, but I like to, I like to have full circle services. So I do like that if someone wants to, they can rent um, a, house, a car from us. I do like that. Okay. All right, Facebook. I'm gonna drop the link one more time for Zoom. And I'm gonna give you guys a couple of minutes, but I am going to sign off because I am not leaving my script. So if you're seeing this, um, as the replay, what's going to happen now is I'm going to talk about my script. I'm going to have to dig it up really quickly because I just clicked the X on it by accident. But 
Um, we're going to talk about one of my scripts for a couple of minutes. I'm going to give you guys five minutes of script. Um, please, if you are not on mute, please mute yourselves because, um, yeah, it creates a negative experience when everyone is not on mute. It's just a bunch of noise. All right, Facebook, I've given you guys enough. I dropped the link. Um, it is now 7.15 Central Standard Time. If for some reason you've gotten to this point and you're confused about what's happening, hop on Zoom. If not, it's been a pleasure. I've dropped the link for the course. Um, the price stays the same for a few days, but it will go up. I realize that I'm giving you thousands of dollars in value for a thousand bucks. And I wanna be fair to myself and to you guys. So I will continue to offer the same great service, but the price of course will increase. It's inflation. <laughs> um, it's been a pleasure. Um, take care, Facebook. I will talk to you guys soon.